what I think could be the most anticipated Daytona Supercross. The most anticipated. Now it's Daytona. There it is for the first time. Very difficult conditions. On a track that others have been so successful on. And he has conquered them. As we drop the gate here at Daytona. We're ready to go racing for the first time ever. Tom Fiala to win. It runs for Energy Supercross. And Jet Lord wins Daytona. The checkered flag is going to fly. Yeah. Celebrating the Frenchman. Yeah, welcome to SMX Insider. I'm still here. The World Center of Racing at Daytona. Ricky Carmichael, amateur supercross taking place behind me on the same track that we watched some big, big statement racing on Saturday night. We're the Jasons, Wygan and Thomas. JT, that's my question. Look, Jet Lawrence wins. Is it just a win or is it a more important win than just a win? Yeah, this this felt more important. Uh, you look at Tomac's track record at this event. He's won five in a row. He'd won seven out of eight. And for Jet to come in there and send that message like, hey, I'm going to beat you, not only on a Saturday night where the championship points are handed out, but at your best racetrack where everybody is picking you to get back on, on championship pace and get back in this title fight. And, and Jet really dominated. I, I don't think you can look at it any other way. Even if you're Eli Tomac, you have to understand that was a really tough thing to swallow as far as the, the story of this championship. And what's wild about these stories, JT, is it looks like it's part of this potentially larger narrative of Jet taking over and becoming the guy when you win like this and you beat Sexton and Tomac straight up and Cooper Webb was never really in it. Ken Roxon wasn't able to challenge him for long. Yet also within that big picture story are these tiny things. So they barely even got started. He barely even got started in this race. Yeah, it was such a close call. You know, they, they went for the wheel change to give him that clean rear tire for the start. And then they had issues both trying to get his, his starting device locked up. That took longer than normal. And then they couldn't get the tire cover off. And I wasn't even involved in this, but my heart rate was spiking watching this all go down. And you, you have to really tip your cap to Jet for keeping his composure there, understanding that it was the last second thing, and then still starting within the top five. Uh, I, I think it speaks a lot to Jet's frame of mind that he was able to keep composure and still execute a really good start there. Yes, I think that's a statement as well because all the little things that can derail a run like this, he's proven that a lot of them aren't gonna affect him in the way they might others. And also a big win at Daytona is Tom Vial. First Supercross win for Tom Vial, that's big. And I think we're gonna find out just how big it is going forward. Maybe he can contend or even win this 250 East title. So let's drill a little bit deeper into his first Supercross victory. It's time for SMX Facts with Clinton Fowler. All right, and there is our man, Clinton. This stat you gave me before the show, I cannot even believe this. So Tom Vial wins. He's the ninth Frenchman to win a Supercross race. But the funny thing is, every French rider who's ever won a Supercross also won at least a Pro Motocross here in America, or vice versa. Anyone who won a Pro Motocross also won a Supercross. It's interesting to me, first, that they're that well-rounded. But second, I think the stereotype is that a lot of the Frenchmen are really good Supercross riders. Some of them are good outdoors. Vial's kind of the opposite. He's known more for his motocross prowess. And as we dive deeper into this, I guess that's what we're going to find out. Is he a motocross guy who won the most motocross-like supercross? Or is this for real? What did you see of the data? Yeah, I mean, in this case, it seems like he's a he's really good at supercross, even though he does seem to, to be known for his pro motocross skills. He set the five fastest laps in that main event on Saturday night. Uh, just absolutely dominating. On par to Ken Roxon's win this year in Glendale. Uh, he was the only guy in the 250 class to set times in the 132s and he was a half a second faster than the next fastest guy, Seth Hamaker. So just an impressive outing. JT, the question I have is, is there an asterisk because of the track conditions that night? I think there has to be, and that shouldn't be viewed as a negative. It's just not the standard, you know, Monster Energy Supercross race that we're used to. And if he comes out and wins in Birmingham, then yes, I will look silly and I'll have to take it all back. But I, I think Arlington being in podium contention is realistic. Daytona with the weather and the track and the way that race is anyway, I just think it's a different event and we, we shouldn't try to compare him rocketing to be the best Supercross rider quite yet. But having said all that, he's got himself in this championship fight and, and that is a big thing. Okay, so that's Vial. Let's talk a little more about this whole French thing. My mind is still blown that they're this well-rounded, that they win both indoors and out. 
Uh, so give us some of the names in history here who Vial has now joined. Yeah, I mean, this list of nine is pretty impressive, guys. Jean-Michel Bale starts that out in 1989. He has 25 wins between both classes in Pro Motocross and Supercross. You got Marvin Muskin, the, arguably the most decorated, maybe not in titles, but the most decorated with 38 wins. Um, but Vial, obviously, that Southwick win, pretty impressive last year. Won three moto scores for the overall, the Daytona win. The thing that I actually think is kind of interesting is the, the regional Daytona Supercross winners. We've got Mikel Pichon back in 1996. You got Purcell, Christoph Purcell in 2009 and 10. Marvin Muskan, 13 and 15, and now Tom Vial. So JT, you got to ask the question, is Tom Vial really a title contender this year? I think he is because of how much parity, you know, no one has really stepped up and just kind of run away with this thing. So the longer that goes on, if you can stay consistent and stay on the podium, why would he not be, right? Because I think we've all looked at, is Hayden Deegan gonna kind of take over? We lost Austin Forkner, who seemed like he was on a path to do that. So until someone steps up and takes the reins of this thing, I don't have any reason to say he's not. Yeah, uh, it's a little different to me. And uh, when I look at some of those French names of the past, they were just absolutely dominant. And they happened to race Daytona that year. And they happened to win that. And they won everywhere else. That, that's what I think of when I think of, say, uh, Pichon or Porcel, who won back-to-back uh, -back titles, and even how good Dylan Ferrandis was. So we'll see if the owl can be that good. Or, or maybe you're right, JT. Maybe you don't have to be dominant. Maybe you just have to be really good every week uh, to win this title. I guess that's what makes it interesting, right, Clinton? Really, how much data do we really have on 250 East, even with three rounds in the book so far? Every race is kind of a weird scenario, especially with that Detroit crash. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been three kind of oddball races so far. Um, I do think it's kind of interesting. There's five French riders that have won a regional Supercross. Three of them have won Daytona and gone on to win. So Pichon in 96, Purcell both in, in 2009 and 10, and Muskin in 2015. And so I think it'd be interesting if Tom Bial can get his first Supercross win in Daytona and then go on to get that title. But I guess that's that's to be seen now, week, right? Oh, that is interesting. So a lot of these Frenchmen turning Daytona wins into eventual titles. We'll see if Bial can do that. And we'll unpack more great stats with you next week. Thanks. 30-second board, let's get to some hot topics in the sport, including the announcement of our SMX playoff venues for 2024. We announced it during the broadcast Saturday night at Daytona. And the surprise here is two new places. We're going back to Charlotte, Z-Max Dragway, but Texas Motor Speedway, that'll be an infield race. And then we're finally getting a race in Vegas again, JT. Yeah, this is going to be great. I think everybody's been looking forward to heading back to the desert for a race in, in Las Vegas. It's going to be different venue than we've ever visited before, but I think just being out there, having that symbolic into a series in Las Vegas will be really cool. But let's jump into that 250E series and Tom Vial gets his first win in Monster Energy Supercross. Now, the question is going to be, was this just Daytona? Was it the conditions or is this a real pivot to Tom Vial being a championship contender and a you know many time future winner in this series because remember he is a two time MX2 winner over in Europe so this is not his first foray into winning. Yeah, we already had all the data there from Clinton earlier with SMX facts but yeah, I think he got to slow the roll a little bit only because only because we saw him dominate the Southwick National last year at motocross his type of conditions sand and then he didn't perform that well to that level again for the rest of the year until we got to the hybrid tracks in the smx playoffs and he was good again so i think he's very very good in the stadiums but that level of dominance we're gonna have to see it in birmingham and going forward so that's my take on that one shout out to supercross futures that got to race at daytona for the first time and what i think this win for drew adams means is not just a win for drew adams kawasaki had this long running history of they are the ones that groom the amateurs that go all the way to the top, including Ricky Carmichael and James Stewart and Ryan Villapoto. And that was supposed to have continued with Austin Fortner, Adam C. And Cerullo. It is not. The injury bug has bit that whole operation so hard over the last decade. So maybe it's Drew Adams could be the next one to do what Kawasaki always used to do. Yeah, and you're, and you're seeing talent 
as it's developing, right? And it's such a, I think it's such a look to the future, literally its namesake of who, the, who are the names of this class gonna be? And you think about over the years, the guys have made it and didn't. The Jet Reynolds, still, that story's still being written. The Adam Cincerillo, he's now a factory 450 superstar, but man, it, it's, it's so great, I think, to watch these kids on that stage have to take on the same racetrack that the pros, that the guys that they're practicing sometimes during the week with. You think about a kid like Drew Adams, He's practicing with Jet and Hunter Lawrence every single day. A kid like Gavin Towers practicing with his monster Yamaha Star Racing teammates throughout the week too. So they know what the level is going to be. I just like to watch the development process and see, you know, for lack of a better term, who's going to make it and who's not. And speaking of that, Weege, you're on site. You're at the RCSX at the time of filming this. Now, it looks sunnier back there than I've seen when I was leaving on Sunday morning. It was raining really hard. What can you tell us about what's going on there at the moment? Uh, don't worry. The damage is already done. Much like the Saturday race, the rain is a factor. Whether it looks sunny and beautiful now, they have been running in and out of hellacious weather. But what's so cool about this race, I literally saw Drew Adams and his dad back in their regular van in the pits this morning because they're still racing this and this kind of started the idea that kids could get that pro experience at a supercross ish race it's not the traditional one and now it's been going for 15 years so even the elite like drew adams still race this and we'll see how it turns out for them especially because they're going to have to deal with somewhat muddy conditions here just like they did on saturday that's good experience going forward ask tom vl what having to ride in rain and mud can do for you as a pro and one other rider who has a lot of experience racing in the mud, and we thought he might be the favorite going into the Daytona main, was Max Anstey, but it didn't work out. Two bad starts in a row, two, six, eight, yet somehow he's the points leader, JT. I talked to his team a little bit. He started a little bit further outside than his team manager, Martin Davalos, would have preferred him to do. Max liked the gate that he had picked, but bad starts are doing Max in right now. Yeah, it's tough. I think he has the pace. Uh, he, he's matured so much in his time in America and, and he's traveled around the world racing. So he has a lot of perspective and I think he has a lot of knowledge about how to approach this series. But if he starts 12th and 15th in those main events, life is going to be very difficult for him. It's amazing that he's been able to hold on to this red plate with two, six, eight finishes. I don't know if that's ever been done before. I would have to think it's not maybe something for Quentin Fowler to kind of research the, the variance and results and still have red on the front of your motorcycle going into the weekends. But uh, pretty wild and crazy 250E series we've seen so far. And speaking of that, you kind of contrast the differences of this weekend, you know, the, the series leaving Arlington, everybody was talking about Monster Yamaha Star Racing, Deegan gets a win, like he looks like he's ready to grab momentum of the series. And then they had a really, really difficult Daytona Supercross, both he and Daxton Bennick hitting the dirt several times on Saturday. But then Monster Energy Pro Circuit bounces back and they are in this thing. You look at McAdoo and Seth Hammack are both on the podium. So it just seems like the, the story of 2024 in both classes has been this pendulum of momentum between teams and each round you could kind of rewrite the whole storybook about how the series has gone. Yeah, this might be the closest championship ever, as you mentioned. I think that's the one thing that bodes well for Anstey. We have not seen close calls or big moments from Anstey, even dating back to last year. He was very consistent. He's been consistent this year. When you look at some of these other riders, Deegan and Bennick, relatively young, we know what McAdoo's story is. He is going to send it, highs and lows. Seth Hamaker, same thing. Vial's a bit of an unknown. We don't know how good he's going to be every week. Maybe he's figured it out. And that's what's led it to this, including Fortner going out. We don't know who's going to be consistent week to week in 250 uh, East, except maybe Anstey. And maybe that's why, even by a slim margin, he's still the points leader. I guess we need to mention Pierce Brown, 555. That's consistent, right? <laughs> Uh, so it's just nuts, that class. And it actually makes the 450 points, JT, look like they're really spread out. Although I will say, by the standards we have this year, a 10-point lead for Jet Lawrence suddenly seems pretty big. Yeah, it does definitely feel like the story has changed, you know, because it's just every time a guy started to slip out of the points, he would come out with this great ride and get right back into the thick of it. And I just really felt like Daytona was a turning point. And Ricky Carmichael smiling right now because he always says the championship starts here, but it really feels 
that way because we have more distance between first and seventh than we have at any point in the series. And you look at guys like Jason Anderson, guys like Ken Roxon, they're over a full race worth of points out of the championship now. And I, I think we're really seeing the stars of, or who's going to be able to take this thing to the distance start to emerge. And those that may just not have it down the stretch starting to fall off the tail end of this thing. So I, I thought it was a really big night as far as the championship goes throughout the top seven, you know, that, that seven, group that we've talked about throughout the, the whole series of who was going to make it and who wasn't. I think we're starting to get some clarity there. Yeah, well, to that point, Aaron Plessinger, he might have won Glendale and could have been the points leader just two races ago. And now all of a sudden we're looking at him being way back. That was a scary crash. Kind of reminded me he went down at Daytona in his rookie 450 season, broke his heel and was out for months. Luckily, he avoided major injury and still finished the race. But that's exactly what you and I were talking about. It doesn't take much. Just two little crashes for him. One rhythm land at Daytona, one corner at Glendale. Whole season looks different for AP now. Yeah, and, and when you look at two out of two rounds out of three, he's crashed. You know, I, I don't think the riding has necessarily been the problem. That's not why he's slipping out of the points. It's the mistakes. But you could say this is his first time really being up there. It's his first time having the red plate earlier this season. And it's the first time I think we've taken him seriously in a championship fight in the 450 class. So there's going to be some learning there. There's going to be some growing pains, but it's the crashing that's really taking him out of this thing. But if you want to talk about crashing and, and the risk of crashing, I think we have to talk about Eli Tomac because this quad jump that went on on Saturday night, I think was the difference. Now, had he done the quad, was he going to win? I don't know. I would say Jet was maybe a little bit better everywhere else, but I think it kept us away from a battle. And for me, the most shocking part of it was that Eli knew coming out of the heat race that he had to do the quad, right? He got past there. He was getting pulled away. They have so much. They have software that shows him where he's losing time. That quad was the story going into the main event. And then he has to watch riders like Cody Shock doing this in the 250 main event. So I was fully expecting him to come out and jump that. For him to not do it, I think was a big moment, right? Mentally, I think he just said, nope, I'm not doing it. I don't want to hurt myself. I'm not going to lose the championship here. But his his counterpart, Jet Lawrence, did it every single lap, seemingly with no real issues. Yeah, this goes back to what I said at the beginning of this. Is this race even more symbolic than just a typical win? This is the easy thing that any fan can understand. When the young guy comes on, he's willing to take the crazy risks. Chet Lawrence has not had many huge crashes in his career. He doesn't even know the downside of this. Eli Tomek's coming off a major injury, and he's 11 years older almost than Jet. So I think even the most novice fan would be like, oh, well, he's not as willing to risk jumping a huge jump in muddy ruts like the kid is. So again, it points to maybe this race is more symbolic than you'd want it to be if you're a Tomac fan and you want to believe he's going to win here at Birmingham coming up this weekend. And maybe he will. Well, the history will decide how important we might remember this race forever for that. Uh, hopefully we remember it as a complete one-off for how it ended. I hope this doesn't happen again. Now it's a cool tradition at Daytona that the fans get to come across the track and go to the podium. It feels very much like a podium at a pro motocross race like Redbud. I've hosted these podiums here for 15 years at this track. It's awesome. But they went too early this year and we had Jason Anderson and Aaron Plessinger had not crossed the finish line and having to weave in and out of spectators. Luckily, they weren't close to each other and they weren't battling. Saw a fan get a hold of Jet Lawrence's goggles while Jet's doing a burnout. Shout out to Jet for having the concentrate, the start and end of the race, the incredible concentration for Jet. But we can't, we can't have this happen again, JT. We can't. Yeah, let's hope not because this is a really cool thing for the fans to get to interact, be near the podium, and and be a part of what goes on because. It's not possible at most of the stadiums and it makes Daytona unique. Yeah, the timing wasn't perfect this week. Thankfully, nothing went really sideways. I'm sure they'll review it, get things right, but uh, it, it is one of the things that makes Daytona so great. Speaking of great, I don't know how else you can really categorize Jets win. And, and I talked to people behind the scenes in his camp. They knew this was a big weekend for all the reasons that Eli Tomac did, right? Both of them felt like this was a chance to send a message to each other. Eli wanting to say, hey, this is my house and it's time for me to get back to this title fight. And Jet wanted to end that talk in Tomac's house, right? That is such a big thing to go to someone's best racetrack and absolutely dominate them. And I think that's what Jet did. You look at how he beat him in the heat, how he beat him in the main event. Eli had no answers 
This was a statement win. Now the points are the same. It pays 25 points. Eli Tomac got 22 points. Nothing huge change there. We got it, right? It's, it's not anything mathematical difference, but the mindset and what they have to deal with you know, Eli Tomac going to bed on Saturday night had to think about that. He really couldn't do anything about Jet Lawrence. I think it was absolutely a huge statement by Jet. And it almost didn't even get started because they tried to do the double. They had to do a wheel change and put a wheel cover on Jet's bike before the start. You probably saw that in the broadcast. They barely, barely got him into the race. So let's dive deeper in. We're going to bring Jet Lawrence's mechanic, Christian, on for our big interview and find out just how stressful that was. He went from almost ruining the race to saving the race for his rider. Yes, big interview time. Well, could have been the GOAT, but ended up being the hero. Christian Ducharme, the mechanic for <laughs> Jet Lawrence. Uh, Will Christian did talk to you after the race, so we got a little perspective already, but that had to be maybe the craziest minute of your life? Yeah, I'd say that probably last minute and a half or so was pretty much a blur and heart rate was probably around 200 uh, the entire time. But yeah, that was probably one of the more stressful moments in racing that I've, I've gone through for sure. Hey, so that's such a scramble just for the fans that maybe don't know everything you had to do in that short amount of time, just run through the whole sequence of what you had to accomplish uh, after the parade lap and before that gate dropped. Okay. Um, so obviously, you know, the gate drops for site lap it goes out. It's about, but it's give or take two minutes. You know, a fast lap time is a minute 30. So about two minutes is gone already out of your five minutes. And then it comes back in. We've got a tire ready. It's already in a wheel cover. And um, I sit next to the stand. He gets off. We throw it on the on the stand. Take, take the wheel off. Pop onto a new wheel. Uh, take the bike off the stand. Wheel on the gate. And then whole shot button. Scramble back. Get that wheel cover off. Obviously not as easy as it being on a stand. You know, you can just undo it. Spin the tire and it comes right off. But... A uh, little little chaos, you know, straps covered in mud from wheeling it over, um, all that little extra kind of, um, what do you call it, extra difficulties of the conditions that play a little factor. You know, a little bit of mud here and there that you don't quite practice for on a nice dry under the tent, you know, run through. Uh, and you have some plans. Uh, I mean, yeah, it'd be tough. You can't have the bike on the stand and on the grade at the same time, but you guys have thought of some ways to maybe make it a little more efficient next time? Yep, uh, for sure. Um, as far as, you know, the second wheel or the spare wheel, you know, it doesn't really need to be a tire wrap. You know, you can take off the stand and, you know, you can just carry the back wheel and wheel it on the mesh. There, there saves a bunch of time. Um, and this not rush the whole shot button. Uh, we kind of, uh, when we first wheeled on the mesh, the bike wasn't completely on the mesh and we're kind of slipping a couple of times getting the whole shot button in. So just moving forward, just going, just cleaning up little little issues that we had. Yeah, so so two questions here in one. Um, first, did you communicate that to Jet? Like, hey, we're not going to have a lot of time, and I'm going to need every second. So if you could kind of hurry up on this parade lap, I would appreciate that because I've in my racing days I was told that like, hey, don't put us in a bind. You got to rush because we've got a lot to do when you get back. You know, and, and motocross can be the same with fuel and things like that. And then the second part of that question: Have you guys done a lot of testing with? A, a clean rear wheel, clean tire versus one that had been out on the parade lap. And you, are you seeing a big performance advantage uh, enough to go through the stresses of the wheel change? Um, yeah, I, I did tell him that. Hey, can you? Because he is very uh, low on his sight laps. He will take his sweet time, which I mean, regardless, that's his thing. That's no worries. But this one was definitely, yeah, hey, man, we got we to we, we, we gotta move on this one. Like, we got some work to do. Um, but testing wise, I mean, it's kind of tough to test, right? Which one is better or worse? But the muddiest part of the track was behind the gate. Um, it was just clay slop. So I think regardless what you can actually get off the tire versus a clean tire, because the, the grate was dry. So if it was a wet mesh, I mean, it's kind of at that point a, a wash. You know, if you're you're like, like uh, San Diego or I mean, especially San Fran, right? At that point, it doesn't really matter if your tire's covered because it's you're not going to get much traction regardless. But this time, the mesh being dry, going on there with a wet clay tire covered in you know mud and muddy clay, that's you're at a disadvantage for sure. So uh, that we were willing to gamble and take the risk and 
get him that extra bonus of trying to get a better start with a clean tire. And what's your relationship like with him? He said in the press conference that things like this strengthen the relationship. It doesn't break the trust. It actually helps it. What's it like uh, as Jed is, you know, everything's more pressure, I'm sure. What's it been like? Um, I mean, we really get along very well. Um, I think that having that, that trust built between the two, right? Like, I think that helps a lot, especially ease his mind on things. I mean, I, I even like going back and like rewatching the race, like, you know, like he looked back a couple times before the gate drop, but like, <laughs> he was like, he'll figure it out. He, I'm going to dump the clutch regardless. I'm going. And like, luckily, you know, it worked out that way. But I mean, I, I have to agree with him. I think these situations, I don't want to have them, right? There's, you know, some things that, you know, I'm not too proud to say I could have been better on during that whole chaos, but, um, you know, having that kind of relationship and that trust with each other definitely helps him get more confidence, I think, as well, and gives me confidence in my job. Sorry that you got the spotlight to maybe when you didn't want it for 90 seconds, but you must be doing something right. <laughs> hey, it, it is what it is. <laughs> I'll awesome. take it. All right, thanks, and uh, we'll see you in Birmingham this weekend. Hopefully you won't be dealing with muddy tires again. We'll see. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll be ready this time. All right. <laughs> thanks, Christian. All right. Thank you. All right, that's enough Daytona. We're moving on to a new venue from the oldest to the newest, Birmingham. This should be awesome. Really have never had a race in the state of Alabama except once. So they did it on the infield of Talladega. So I think we're going to see a lot of fans, maybe the people you see in Atlanta and Jacksonville and Tampa and all the other Southeastern events over there. That'll be awesome. But what about the track here, JT? Break it down for us. It's Yamaha track map time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. They've had a lot of rain there, so we'll see what that does to the dirt composition because that can be more important than anything we're looking at with the racetrack. But yes, that typical long straightaway football type layout. And yes, it is a soccer stadium, but the shape of the stadium plays a huge part. Notice the really long start, which should give riders some room to move around. Gives an opportunity to challenge the racers and, and usually presents the best racetrack. Okay, so we'll see how Birmingham turns out. If you folks want to watch it, well, just come and watch it in person or check out the coverage on Peacock and the SMX video pass that's outside the United States. It'll be 1.30 Eastern time Saturday, race day live, and 7 o'clock Eastern time Saturday, we will go racing. I'm excited just to go to a new venue, and we hear it's very similar to Snapdragon Stadium in San Diego, so we'll feel probably more familiar than you think uh, once you're actually there. Uh, one other thing that you wanted to mention, JT, is this amazing gesture of sportsmanship between Justin Hill and Freddie Noren that we saw on Saturday. Yeah, this was a really tough crash. Um, obviously, Freddie Noren had to feel terrible landing on top of Justin Hill, and that's a really scary thing. And for Freddie Noren to kind of break out of race mode, forget about his own well-being and result to go help Justin Hill, I just like that because it shows the humanity and the sportsmanship and the camaraderie that these guys have for each other. Because at the end of the day, they all know the risks they're taking, and, and he wanted to make sure that Justin Hill was okay. Yeah, that's really cool. And they should both be good enough to be back uh, this weekend. Been a hard luck season for Hill. I talked to him. He said, I got to start having fun and taking this less seriously and not be so down on how the results have been. He's still got the creativity and the good riding. Always fun to have more contenders up there. We'll see how they perform. we got Birmingham coming up. Can anyone answer back to what Jet Lawrence threw down at Daytona? We're going to find out.